Look at all those records behind you. Big shelf. Hi. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you, man. <laughs> and look, I'm doing this in Toronto. You guys are in Montreal. I'm driving as soon as this interview is done. So I'll see you guys tonight. Uh, oh, good. Awesome. So let's start with this. I love that you guys had an excuse to put Elijah back in the New Zealand wilderness for no good reason to have him wander around. <laughs> I mean, same if if you could just talk about i mean you guys obviously collaborated last film you guys worked together for many years if we could talk about what brought this project to the fore this was um a, another crazy idea of toby and myself toby the writer um who did uh, the greasy strangler and come to daddy um so we we really wanted to mine a parental fear that we both had which was not stepping up in a time of crisis what we call in New Zealand, shitting the bed in front of your kids. Uh, and so, and I was like, who are we going to use to amplify that mild trauma for comedic effect? And it was, we wrote the script for Elijah. I, we didn't really have a backup plan if he had said no. Um, no. So <laughs> sent it through. I do remember Elijah saying, oh, we've got to get back to New Zealand at some stage. And I was like, hey, I think I can do it. I think I can make this work. I've got the very thing. <laughs> I've got the very thing. So um, we need our rocks and trees and he'll come. <laughs> he, yeah, he's not going to be freaked out about where we're shooting this film. There was, look, there was some natural tie-ins to your um, history, filming history in New Zealand. We we covered similar terrain, but also we had some of the crew on our film that were on uh, uh, Lord of the Rings that knew it was like a reunion for Elijah. It was. Really. But I want to talk about something, Elijah, specifically in your career. You obviously started as a child actor. You're sure. working with this incredible performer. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you could talk about the dynamic there. Now you're parenting to this rising star. If you could talk about the dynamic just as an actor and just seeing a new generation sort of unfold sort of before your eyes on screen. Look, it's so funny. I, I you know, I don't, having, having started as a young actor um, when I was eight, it's funny as an adult now, because I don't know that I work with kids and then and call back on my own experience and sort of feel like the elder I, I especially with Nell to be honest she is very much a peer she's so accomplished and so capable and she was so prepared the character is so precocious she kind of nailed all of that so I didn't I don't know I, I occasionally get the sense or would feel the young person looking up to the older person but I just don't feel that way um I don't feel like the elder I feel like just a, an actor working with another actor and again I, I think that's a real credit to her she she brought so much acumen and professionalism and presence that it, you know, there there was no sort of um, loose end to help with. Uh, not that I would have necessarily, but it didn't feel like, um, yeah, dynamically, I didn't feel like the elder. I just felt like another actor. And that's, again, it's a real credit to her. And we, we had so much fun. You know, I think it was probably the first time I've played a father. Exactly. So that, that was new, certainly. The, the, the similarity to uh i mean there's a little similarity to norval in that it's it's a it's a guy kind of out of his depth who is projecting uh a confidence that you know underneath is actually totally bullshit um in this case this is a guy who probably had had a real career um and he's sort of in the twilight of his career now and is kind of trying to pick up the pieces but he's very much trying to present to his daughter that he is this strong um capable you know successful person so that that really for me is where where to, to where i could kind of focus on that the, those dynamics um and you know i think being a father now myself i'm sure there there was some of that that was just imbued in the performance that kind of just came out naturally being a being a dad so not, um, not to push to or two psychologists we're putting you on a couch here this is this is a character who's been tangential to success, and it's a really fascinating role for you. I don't, I can't think of another one that you've done that has this specific level of sort of emotional ennui, where he's he's sort of in this liminal space, this in between space between adulthood and the dreams of childhood, and you have a child that calls him on his shit. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you could talk about sort of developing this role. Was it strictly on um on on the page that you got or was there something specific um that you drew upon for these uh, for bringing this character to life great question um 
it really is paramount to the 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 dynamic of uh, what Strawn's going through and then ultimately what hap is happening between the two of them. Um, a lot of it was present within the writing um, as far as the kind of projecting that Strawn does. The other half of that is being believably someone capable of uh, being a magician. I am not one. I remember very early on, Ant was, would send me, this is months before we went down to New Zealand to start shooting. Ant would send me, I was in production on another thing, and he'd send me these videos that were quite complicated and complex um, card tricks. And he's like, try this one, try this one. I'm like, oh, fuck. Oh, man, his expectations of what I can deliver in a short amount of time, I'm really terrified. I didn't end up needing to do those things, but I did work with a magician, um, this guy called Mike uh, Piscata in Los Angeles, who works at the um, at the Magic Castle. Mm -hmm. And for a month prior to going to New Zealand, I sat with him weekly to just work on card dexterity because there aren't necessarily any tricks that were specific to have to learn. It's it's a lot of like in camera stuff. Um, and some fine editing. But the important thing was that I that that I'd be believable with a deck of cards in terms of how I handle them, how I shuffle them, how I fan them, those things. And so I really just kind of focused on that as an element of the character that would be believable. Cause I it's just, you know, it's one of those things, it's a it's a pet peeve of mine where if if you are if you are having to sort of display a, um, a skill that you don't have in a film, that that be as believable as possible. Oh, you and don't I play don't piano play. like this? Yeah, it's when you see the piano players doing this. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh my God. So it's just, it was important to me. Um, and so hope, hopefully I, I pulled that off. But as far as the other dynamic aspect, it, you know, very present within the context of the script. And and we had a nice week of rehearsal between myself and Nell and, and, and Ant, where we were able to go to locations and, and really work on those those dynamics as well. And Anne, I want to talk about this because I think the most remarkable thing about this film is how tonally it is it is skating a real fine edge. I think a lot of people will be very surprised by the film. It's incredibly emotional, but it's you are focusing on essentially a loser. But we have to believe that he has skills and it just hasn't worked out. Mm. He's not a great parent, and then we see at him become a great parent. It's a precocious daughter. It's all of these things that should be off-putting, and yet we are always engaged. We are always there with the character. You can talk about making that fine line work, about about having it so that it's believable when they're a mess, but also believable that when they inevitably sort of figure stuff out. Look, it, it would be a very different film if Elijah wasn't in it. It would be a terrible film, I, I suspect. <laughs> um, wow. No, it's literally at the, um, it's the same reason why Come to Daddy works so well is because we have a character from all senses of sense of purpose should be frustrating and annoying for the audience. But the just the inherent likability that Elijah brings to characters um, gets us over that initial first hurdle with audiences and they accept him. And the vulnerability feels real, you know, and there's a s s huge amount of empathy that we knew we had to have. Um, and without that, it would just be a cartoon or a caricature and it would just, it would start falling apart. It would be a house of sticks. So it was, you know, just him accepting the role, we were over the first biggest hurdle. Mm. And then for finding the perfect Mildred, once we had those two elements and felt comfortable with that, all these other things that we knew were going to have to be a fine balance, I felt like sure the tonally uh, we were going to be we were going to be able to hold fast and it, it it took a lot of pressure off. If I was questioning whether that was going to happen um, with with different people, then it could have could have been a very different film at it. But I felt confident that the chemistry between them worked really well. Um, the characters' growth through the film they all they both have little mini arcs within them. They both it's mm. a coming of age dual coming of age movie in a way but it's also like an oddball buddy movie <laughs> you know set and so it just sort of mind all these things that i that i know as cinema short hand i feel very comfortable with mm. types of film but not in a, like a xerox way but just in those sort of like those big themes because i don't i never drill down on these memories of films my nostalgic vision of, of cinema that i grew up with I don't technically I don't remember anything, which obviously shows in my films, but I all I remember is like emotional moments. You know, that's what I remember. Like 
key sort of pivotal things. It's the sneeze at the end of Pelham one, two, three. It's just like cinema little moments. And I, you know, I all I want to do is capture those kind of real um cinematic moments that have a an emotional weight to them mm. and so if we pull off a few of those in, in, a, in a film i'm super super proud and super happy and i think i think we now nailed, nailed a few in this one that work really well i mean you know how we as film critics want to be so clever i mean as, as my review is coming out it's like this is one of those like kurt russell 1960s disney films meets <laughs> midnight run right amazing <laughs> so that's a great so, reference so there's there's this dynamic between the two of you where mm. again it's not she's she's precocious mm. and right and obviously is book smart is is actually knows what's going on but still incredibly believable not some sort of you know superhero just somebody who sort of engaged with this and you are a father plunged in from outside their comfort mm-hmm. zone sort of literally in the wilderness here mm-hmm. Let's let's talk specifically about the casting. Um, th- obviously, you wrote it. You said you wrote it for Elijah, but you had to nail your central protagonist. Could you talk about the challenge of actually finding the right person to not only be in the role to actually be in these endeavors, but to pull off mm-hmm. a New Zealand accent as well? Totally, and the movie does hinge on that character. Yeah, of I mean, it, it, Mildred is the central like character. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, well, only, knew... it's only Jaws where the shark doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't. We weren't worried about Elijah dropping the ball at, at any stage, so I felt pretty confident we had nailed that. Okay. So it was really um, now it was you know in these uh, call outs in the US for those sort of roles that yeah. are kind of like breakout roles for the right child actor, they probably go through twenty thousand or whatever. But we're in New Zealand, there's a limited pool of actors, so but there was still like maybe up around three hundred that we auditioned and went through. Mm-hmm. And for me, as a filmmaker, it was just great to see the depth of you know of quality of actor out there which was encouraging but it was really just like it had to be the right the right child and we got down to a short list and then when we did chemistry reads with elijah and it was all still like covid was bouncing around not that we could do it live but everything was zoom for a while yeah that's and, right and so we did some um zoom reads together and now just popped you just just could instantly tell like got excited straight after the quarters like holy mm-hmm. smokes this mm-hmm. This kid's really special. Um, didn't hurt that similar features. I could buy her as as a as a Strawn's child, um, so that kind of all worked in well with it. And then when we just finally got down to it, um, met her in person, it just it was like, yeah, she's the real deal, and she just brought so much confidence. Like this kid is supremely confident and smart as hell. Like she's she is the bookworm. She is Mildred on so many counts and had no qualms of like questioning things pushing back asking curiosity factor mm-hmm. through the roof mm-hmm. um and then i talked to lee cronin who just because evil dead rise had shot in new zealand as well and she had been throughout that whole ring and that was a tough as hell shoot and we were going to go into a very similar shoot as she's the she's the lead she's it's outdoors for 90 percent of the time mm-hmm. uncontrollable conditions in every frame, it's it's a lot to ask. So I asked Lee, I said, like, how was she under pressure? She's got covered in goop and <laughs> like, that was he was doing stunts and all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. And he just said, he just said, hire her immediately. Just get this, get her. She's going to be a massive star. And so he just he was so enthusiastic about her. I was just like, we are making the right decision. She's brilliant. Let's go for it. And locked it in. And, and again, look, we're annoying critics. I go on about this. Like you see things that echo other things. My favorite scene of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is that dynamic between the child actor and Leo when they're sitting oh. on the chairs mm. and, and and they're both trying to emotionally crush each other. But she is so weaponized <laughs> with it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, that, it's that dynamic. I'm wondering, Elijah, if you could talk about sort of that sense obviously you are never more humbled than when you are a parent <laughs> you are you you have this notion of what is going to be and then when it actually happens it's obviously something different so this is somebody without this i just can witness it if you could talk about that specific thing because i think again i, I a lot of people are going to be coming to this film thinking of his grand scale its scope his adventure this is an incredibly emotionally rich and mm-hmm. it's a character piece at a, on a fundamental level so if you could talk about drawing out those deeper emotions that we, frankly, haven't allowed you to res- um, express in quite such an eloquent way in many years. 
Oh, thanks, Jason. Well, I, look, I think it, it is central to, to Strawn's journey that he is faced with the father that he isn't and having to rise to be the, 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 the father that he can be, right? And he comes there with this sort of pomp and circumstance of all the confidence in the world. And I'll, I'll dazzle her. I'm dad. I'm here. I'm going to, you know, this sort of savior. And it falls flat on its face. As and if there are tricks to parenting. I mean, that's the, the fundamental thing. As if what's you, that? If you know the magic trick, parenting just will well, work. Well, exactly. Exactly. And, and, it, and it fails. It fails miserably. He can't connect at all. Nothing can connect. He can't impress her. Mm. And, and it's this thing of, of the only way that they can connect is through vulnerability. It's through breaking all those things down. And it was a lot of fun, actually. It was fun to build this ridiculous person. <laughs> And, and, you know, th that opening sequence where he meets her and does this magic trick and, and it just falls on its fucking ass was a total joy to play. And it's from that moment on, really, that it just all starts to crumble. And it was it, it was fun to, to find that dynamic. And through, honestly, I think, was the, some of the discovery of it happened in real time. You say that it, it is quite emotional, and it is. And that was in the script, but I found that the process of making it, we found more emotion that was e than was even there on the script. And it obviously is about a, a father and a daughter coming together and a father realizing his own capabilities and really, really truly rising to the occasion of being a father in the end. And I think the, 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 the emotional depth that we were able to get with that came through the experience of the making of it. And the dynamic that that occurred between Nell and I, that is not a thing that you can really prepare for. I think some of that comes from my own experience being a father, for sure. But it's also just the the understanding of when you when you break those those sort of surface um, ideas that you present down, and you get really real. You you kind of have to face your own fears. Um, and and express those fears to then come through the other side to sort of really find your strength. And that's kind of what happens. We have time for <laughs> one last question. I need to yeah. talk about the look. You look amazing with long hair, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm like, I'm, I mean, yeah. let's, let's put it this way. I look like a mess, but I'm like, oh, so that's no. how it works. If we could talk about the look, the yeah. sort of the... Obviously, there's some David Blaney and <laughs> sort of nonsense going on here. But if you could talk about developing that look and what it's like for you to wear something that's a subtle mask, not not the sort of um, giant makeup stuff, but there's yeah. something so specific about this look that uh, for me completely yeah. defines the character. Well, why don't you start with your inspiration first? Yeah, because that it was yeah we 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 always go push it to the extreme. Yeah, first. Uh, same with Norville and Come to Daddy. So we were going like full late 90s, early 2000s, Chris Angel. It was going to be tats, you know, wow. the effort here and everything, jewelry the, up the wazoo. Um, and then it was kind of like, then you, then we had fusing that with David Blaine style, kind of cash call, um, effortless. Um, and then like, let's just merge those two qualities together. I mean, he brought most of the look himself. It was all mostly real you like all the facial hair and everything's sure. Elijah. yeah um, yeah cool. darkened up a little bit and mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. um and then just the the hair it was just a great wig like it was a great look the, the makeup and hair team did such a good job of making it oh, naturalistic yeah steph did an incredible job um and then once you were in it i've got all these i've got the whole you know birth of of the character um photo essays of just popping into the makeup as you were as you were going through the transformation and I was just like once once it started coming together it was like okay this is perfect it wasn't too much it was kind of just like you know that fish out of water element had to be really strong and you know the, absolutely the fashion sense had to be like you know he's in boots right in the middle of the southern island south island of New Zealand it's ridiculous it's like he's not prepared for it but we didn't want it to go Cut full Kate you know, flowing regalia. Um, so we, yeah, we kept toning it down, except I did make him wear that ridiculous El Topo hat uh, for the first introduction, um, which everyone on the set said, don't do it. <laughs> oh, the, the, hat's, the hat's amazing. I could totally picture you, Elijah, in the 90s at the Viper Room wearing that outfit. I that mean, is hilarious. 
yeah, I, like this, I like your cape one for your monologue. That's a I love that. That's too. a very cool look. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it was similar to Norval. There, there was a, a an extreme that it starts at where the inspiration is quite mad, which is a really fun place to start because then it just becomes a sort of it's modulations. It's breaking those things down a little bit, finding a way to make it feel real in the context of the real world, but also heightened too. And to the point that that made. That first moment you see him is really key. Again, similar to Norval, it's your first impression. And so it has to be a little bit more resplendent um, and peacocky. And then from there, it can be a little bit more realistic. And it was just finding the balance. It was honestly a collaboration between Steph, yourself, our wardrobe team, just kind of finding elements, you know, trying on um, different jackets, different, you know, combinations of jewelry, and just sort of finding modulations where you're like, okay, th there he is. Now I've, I've found this person. And it's a blast. I mean, that get, giving get, being given the opportunity to sort of play with these elements, the hair, the, you know, facial hair, various kind of costumed elements to then kind of find the character is, a, is so much fun. I you can't wait for people to cosplay. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I will see you guys tonight. Congratulations. Oh, Enjoy Montreal. And thank you guys so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Jason. Guys, congrats congrats, congrats you, on the man. film. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, dude. We'll see you later. Thanks, Jeff.